Good day, SV Maidens. Today we are going to start a teaching on the Holy Spirit that will be divided into three parts or three teachings. We are finding ourselves increasingly more aware of danger all around us. The realities of the time of the tribulation is starting to be more real than ever, and it's important that we stay focused on our Lord and look to Him in the midst of the storms. Many challenges will face us in the time to come, and what we do have is the comfort of the Holy Spirit and the Word of God to prepare us. So it's important that we understand and read New Testament Scripture in that light because it was written in a time of great persecution. The tribulation will be like a storm as never seen before. At our Yes Fair Maidens prayer meeting, I was discussing the gifts of the Holy Spirit, and this is basically where this teaching has been birthed from. And I realized that not only do we need the gifts of the Spirit in our daily walk, but especially in the time to come. When reading John 14, where the Lord mentions the Holy Spirit, that is the comforter that will come, I noticed that from John 13 to 17, it's one discussion. And I want to share with you a diagram that will give you a foundational understanding with regard to Yeshua's introduction of the Holy Spirit to the disciples. So here you can see this diagram. Um, you can see that it's two particular books are mentioned, that of John and 1 Corinthians, where the Holy Spirit is specifically discussed. There is a pattern within these chapters that I want to highlight to you today. I want to focus first on John 14 to 16, and then in the next devotional teaching I will speak on 1 Corinthians 12 to 14. Now in both John 14 and John 16, the Lord specifically speaks about the Holy Spirit. But right in the middle between John 14 and 16, we find John 15, where Yeshua talks to his disciples about abiding in the vine and how they can do nothing without him. And I wondered why the two chapters about the Holy Spirit has a chapter of abiding nestled in between. And then the Spirit said to me that dependence upon him is of utmost importance when it comes to living in, by the Spirit. Now, of course, this is nothing new to us. We know this. However, please understand that God in his wisdom placed that chapter right in the middle so that we may understand just how vital it is when it comes to our relationship with the Holy Spirit. This abiding has to be understood in the context it is given, and the context is obedience unto the Spirit. Abiding in him is to obey the Spirit. When Yeshua speaks about the Holy Spirit in John 14 and 16, the context is that of a close relationship and how the Holy Spirit will teach, comfort, guide and help us in all things, including reminding us of what the Lord said and telling us of things to come. The gifts of the Spirit is not the focus in this chapter, but our relationship with the Holy Spirit. Yeshua wanted them to know that he is coming in the place of him to look after them and guide them just as he did. The difference is that he would be in them. And this is why he told the disciples that it's better for him to leave because now the Spirit can live in them and do through them the works of God. John 17, Christ's high priestly prayer, is birthed out of this conversation where his particular focus is that of union with the Godhead through the Spirit. So it's all about relationship and knowing the love of God by virtue of our union. How closely we walk with the Spirit is vital for us in receiving this information about what is to come and to remind us of what Yeshua said, especially when we think of the time to come. We need to know the voice of the Spirit. We need to be able to discern and have learned how to walk in utter dependence upon the Spirit because it will truly only be by the Spirit that we will survive the time to come. Our dependence on the Holy Spirit, to be guided by the Spirit, to know His voice is vital for living by the Spirit. Without this, 
We can do nothing. And when he says we can do nothing, it's not that we can do nothing ourselves, but we can do nothing that constitutes the life of God through us. For only that which is of the Spirit is life. So you can clearly see how John 14 and 16, or 14 to 16, Yeshua is addressing our relationship in dependence to the Holy Spirit, especially for the time to come. He was not talking to them specifically about the outpouring of the Holy Spirit that would come as read in Acts 2, but how to live by the Spirit once the outpouring has come. They received the Holy Spirit when Yeshua blew on them after his resurrection, when they were together prior to the upper room. They received the Ruach, just as Adam received the Ruach and the Zoe life of God. But the baptism came in the upper room and was poured over them. This speaks of being anointed with fire, the baptism of fire John the Baptist mentioned. Paul tells us that he gives his spirit to those who obey him. To abide is to obey. In John 15 he says, if you love me, you will do my commandments. He constantly tells them that when they bear fruit, it will constitute them being his disciples. The word disciple has within it the word discipline. It's a discipline to abide in his word, in his love and in him. It's not automatic. It requires that you stay vitally connected to him in obedience in all things. Think of a branch that is cut off and no longer in union with a vine. The branch laying on the ground cannot produce any leaf, let alone fruit. It no longer drinks from the sap that is the life of the vine. The spirit of God is that sap. So the focus of John 14 to 16 is that of complete dependence in obedience to the Holy Spirit. Then we have 1 Corinthians 12 and 14 that is about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Paul goes into great detail about their differences in chapter 12 and then speaks more about the gift of tongues and interpretation within the church in chapter 14. And just like John 14 to 16, that has a chapter in the middle, we find 1 Corinthians 13, the well-known love chapter, also in the middle. Here the issue is not being able to do nothing, but rather that without love you are nothing. In fact, the scripture reference here in this diagram refers to some of the gifts spoken about in 1 Corinthians 12. This then has to do that although you have all these wonderful gifts of the Spirit to do wonderful things, they literally mean nothing without love. Therefore, love and dependence upon the Spirit lies at the heart of living by the Spirit. This is not something we can overlook. This is not a general statement from the Lord, but He deemed it so important that He made a point of it to place it there between these two chapters talking about the Holy Spirit. Right? He placed it right there in the middle. And the gifts of the Spirit, right in the middle, he talks about love. It serves as an anchor that will sustain our relationship with the Spirit and as the life of the gifts he gives. Without abiding, we will be deceived. Without love, our gifts will mean nothing and we will be nothing. This is no small thing. And to the degree that you do this is the degree that you live by the Spirit. In other words, we cannot address the gifts of the Spirit without first addressing abiding in Him and the love of God. So the next devotional teaching will focus more on the gifts while this one on the abiding in God Listen attentively while searching your heart because we need to be ready for what is to come. Watchman Nee says that walking by the Spirit is the equivalent of how we have always walked by our soul power. In other words, we have learned from the moment of our first breath to be led by our carnal nature. However, once you are born of the Spirit, you now have to live by the Spirit. 
The Holy Spirit will never control us unless we submit first. To submit is to act out of your will. In essence, we are always submitting. It's just a question unto whom we are submitting to. Uh, Romans 6.16, Paul says, Know ye not that to whomsoever ye yield yourselves as servants to obey, his servants ye become whom ye obey, whether sin which leads unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. In Romans 8, Paul speaks about the flesh that is in enmity with the spirit. The flesh is not referring to our physical bodies. The flesh in this context is that sinful or carnal nature or law that abides in us. This is that which Paul mentions in Romans 7 that causes him to do that which he does not want to do and that which he does want to do, he does not. It's then that Paul asks, who can save us? Who can deliver us? And we cannot live this Christian life in the flesh. We have to live it by the Spirit. We are all fighting against that fleshly nature or the law of sin that is at work within the body. Paul then says that with our mind we serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. So there's two laws, the law of God and the law of sin. He's not saying that we are serving the law of sin with our body, merely that this law of sin resides in us through the flesh or carnal nature. So the more you die to your carnal nature and kill the flesh, the more you will walk in the spirit and be a servant unto the spirit. It's either or. So let's look at another diagram. Okay. Okay. Two laws, two masters. Either sin is your master or righteousness is your master. Either flesh is your master or the spirit is your master. And this, they seek to control the same thing. Your emotions, knowledge, intellect, passions and desires. That is your soul. Right? It's your soul. The Holy Spirit wants us to give our soul, all of us, to him, that it may be sanctified and used for the glory of the kingdom of God. The enemy desires the same. You see, the areas mentioned of the soul, which is your emotions, knowledge, intellect, passions, and knowledge uh, uh, desires, in themselves, they are not bad. It's a part of what makes us different from animals in that with these we either serve the law of sin or we serve the law of God. Within us there is a mixture of both and how this is lived out is through our bodies. Your body receives the instructions from your mind and it then obeys the command, whether the law of sin or the law of God. Our enemy wants complete control of our body, soul and spirit. But guess what? So does God. In 1 Thessalonians 5.23, Paul writes, And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, meaning completely. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved. Spirit, soul and body, your whole spirit, soul and body be preserved, blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So God wants your whole being set apart to him, body, soul, and spirit. How our Father deals with this to have us completely is by using the sword of the spirit, the word of God, to cut in order to divide between bone and marrow, soul and spirit, and to discern the intents and motives of the heart. The flesh and the spirit must be divided. Unless this happens, there will always be within us a mixture of that which is flesh and that which is spirit. The flesh nature fights for that territory and so does the spirit. This is why in Galatians 5, Paul tells us that the flesh lusteth, which means to breathe after, the spirit. But it also says the spirit does the same after the flesh. It talks about that enmity between them. There's only one solution 
to the flesh, the cross. You cannot subdue or try to control flesh. This is why in James 3 we read that he who is able to control his tongue can control his whole body. It says that no man can control the tongue. We simply cannot control the flesh. And the word clearly states that it must die. Now, what allows this mixture is our will. Remember, the Holy Spirit will not control us, but the enemy seeks to. The enemy wants to control and manipulate people. He wants to control their will, emotions, knowledge, passions and desires, your soul. However, though we want to be controlled by the Spirit, we want this, it will never be without our consent. God is a God of order and he's a perfect gentleman. He will treat us with respect and love and he's just waiting on us to let go, to submit, to trust and obey. And this lies at the heart of abiding because unless you submit, that is to say humble yourself, you will not abide. The moment you first and foremost humble yourself, you will be able to resist the devil. What does it mean to submit then? You are literally saying, Lord, I cannot, but you can. Do it through me, please. Many people resist the devil without submitting themselves first unto the Lord and wonder why they cannot seem to overcome. Or they think they have submitted, but in truth, they have not truly. Or in part, we are to submit ourselves in that moment of temptation to him, but your whole life must be in subjection to him as well. If not, you leave doors open for the enemy to come and lie, steal and kill. When you submit first, which is to humble yourself, acknowledging that you cannot do it, it's then that the Holy Spirit says, just what I've been waiting for, move over, and let me deal with the flesh. That flesh would not be the person you are have or are having a problem with, but the flesh in you. It's the spirit that cuts between soul and spirit, not you. And in that moment, the Spirit of God gives us the grace to do the will of God, that which the flesh causes us not to do. So without Him, we truly cannot do anything. To abide is to obey. But that obedience can never be from our own effort because we will fail miserably time after time. We are also, according to Romans 8, uh, told to habitually kill this flesh nature in us. So do not give up. Stay the course until the very root is plucked out and it can no longer produce fruit in you. Your body is in subjection to your will which in turn is either in subjection to the will of the law of God or the law of sin. You get to choose. The Spirit will not work through you unless you are fully submitted to Him. This is why Paul says that with our mind, through intelligent choice, we serve the law, law of God because your will is involved. So this brings us to many different voices out there. The enemy constantly speaks to us. We speak to ourselves through our own thoughts. And then, of course, we have the Spirit of God speaking to us. Different voices, not to mention the voices out in the world in its many forms. Yeshua said that we are to live by every word that comes from the mouth of God. It's imperative that we learn to discern between these voices because we want to follow his voice and live by his words that he speaks to us. This is part of abiding. Remember, the aim is to control the faculties of the soul in order to take control of the whole person. It is through submission to the promptings of the spirit, recognizing his voice that our soul, our emotions, will, intellect and desires are controlled by the spirit through submission to the promptings of the spirit. And the result is the fruit of the Spirit. So our mouth, most of the time, gives away whom we submit it to. A saucer always testifies of what the cup is full of. Whom you submit to in any area of your life is revealed by the fruit it produces. We are told that a tree is known by its fruit. 
And this is why Paul made it clear to us that our bodies no longer belong to us, but have been bought with a price. That's in 1 Corinthians 6 verse 20. He says, For ye are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Our body literally does no longer belong to us. Neither does your spirit. Yeshua said, Father, a body thou hast prepared for me to do thy will. And in the same way, a body was prepared for us to do his will. That's the purpose of your body. Therefore, the body is not sinful and it is also not yours. Hence why we are told to present it as a living sacrifice, as a reasonable service unto the Lord. What does this mean, reasonable service? It means this is the most elementary part of serving him, that your body no longer belongs to you. How many of us still suffer in this area, throwing in a tantrums with just the idea of it? Have we truly submitted our bodies to him? Have you? Have you given him your eyes, ears and mouth? Have you given him your time, your sleep and even the way you dress? Have you given him in part or all? As a side note, this is one of the reasons why fasting is good for us. The flesh hates fasting. As logical and elementary as this sounds, it's the very foundational truth or principle upon which your spiritual walk is built upon. That your body is under new ownership and does not belong to you anymore. This means that unless you have wholeheartedly given him your body, there will always be a mixture of flesh and spirit. There must be a revelation and understanding of new ownership. Mere parroting of a reality does not make it a truth for you. You need to ask him to make it a reality for you so that you can live it. Require and seek this of him, no matter the cost. And there's a price that you pay now and eternally or in eternity for compromise. Recently, one of the fair maidens sent me an email and she thanked me for my transparency and how I share what I go through and what Father shows me. I was blessed by her words because it surely is not easy to make myself so vulnerable on a platform that so easily takes what someone says and rips it to pieces. That very same day, my mom told me she had a dream of me. In this dream, she came to me where I was hanging up washing. What caught her off guard is that I was naked and as I hanged them on the line, I also put them on. I explained to her that this dream meant to hang your washing for the whole world to see. I needed to hear this dream because I did not want to share a dream Father gave me because of just how shocking it is. In fact, because I did not want to receive it, I struggled with this teaching. <laughs> I was fighting him. I was kicking against the goats. It was only as I submitted to him that it started to flow as it should. I had to lay down any self-preservation to want to cover up myself. It was a over my dead body moment for me. <laughs> it's of a sexual nature and he gave it to me first because there was something I needed to lay down. And secondly, for you to understand the graphic and crude nature of the flesh towards our body that belongs to him. With that, I first want to say that addressing this is not outside our, of the scope of Scripture. I'm also assuming that we're all grown-ups here and not so holy that we cannot deal with these things. Genesis 38, 9-10 says, it's talking about Onan. And Onan knew that the seed should not be his. And it came to pass when he went into unto his brother's wife that he spilled it on the ground, lest that he should give seed to his brother. And the thing which he dis did displeased the Lord, wherefore he slew him also. Leviticus fifteen sixteen says, And if any man's seed of copulation go out from him, then he shall wash all his flesh in water and be unclean until the even. By now, I'm sure you know where I'm going with this. Before I tell you the dream, I want to first tell you of another dream and how the Lord showed me that uh, he wants me to address this certain issue in my life. I'm only going to tell you part of this dream because the rest is meant for the next teaching. So 
In this dream that I had, I was in one of the fair maiden's new home that they just recently moved in. I don't know who it was in my dream, only I knew it's a fair maiden, which means that it represents all of them. The new house represents the new thing he will be doing in the ministry, but also the house represents being the temple or the house of the spirit. So we were sitting in the kitchen and everything was white. On the counter was my housewarming gift, a mother-in-law tongue plant, and this plant is usually dark green. However, in the dream, it was bright, bright red. I gave it to her and said, this is the best housewarming gift I can give her. Now, the mother-in-law tongue plant's leaves looks like sharp tongues, and the redness is a reference to the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, where they waited in the upper room of the house, and the Spirit was seen on them as fiery tongues. And this is also why the emphasis was made on house warming. Okay, so I was guided to watch a series after this, as the Lord often speaks to me through various movies or series. In this particular one, a lady was quite overweight and the gym instructor, whose name is John Kim, sent one of his team members to give her a gift for her new office, a mother-in-law tongue plant. I almost fell off my chair. John means grace and Kim means royal fortress. He was an heir to a major company. So I'm sure you see the connections. In this program, he tells her as her personal trainer, you do not get to do what you want. Your body now belongs to me. And I knew immediately what the Lord was saying to me. Tight, time to lose some weight, girl. Well, in transparency, I've used food to just get a break from so many things I've gone through and the things he shows me. It's caught up to me and, well, it stuck to my hips. And I know I'm not the only one. We use different things in life to get by and our intention may not necessarily be to have these things as crutches. But in the end, it is the flesh that gets a hold through it. So Father was telling me that my body does not belong to me. So that night he gave me this dream. I dreamed that I woke up and I looked down at my body only to see that it was not my body that I was in. Not only that, but it was a man's body. I decided to have a peek and saw that I had a penis. And in this dream, I wondered if this body would react if I touched it. I started to masturbate in this dream and I wanted to hide it from others. I then heard the words self-gratification. And that was the dream. Now maybe you are, just like I did, thinking that it is unthinkable for God to give someone a sexual dream to make his point. I ask, Lord, are you sure? Do you really want me to share this dream? Give me an example in scripture that will put their minds at ease. Well, I was amazed at the example he gave me. He said, Peter's vision of the sheet with the unclean food. Well, the context of that vision is that Jew and Gentile are to receive the gospel and the unclean food was referring to the Gentiles, the food Peter was allowed to eat. But Father gave me this example because I have to understand that it was such a stretch for Peter to receive a vision like this, unthinkable, that God would want him to eat unclean food. Their history tradition and desire to serve God in holiness made this tremendously difficult for Peter to accept. And God used that which was unclean to make his point. So we must be careful not to put him in a box. This vision of Peter just so happens to be about food as well. So even after this, I said to the Lord, May I share some more scriptures, Lord? I know of more that would not really be considered eloquent speech from your prophets giving a message from you. Just to cover myself, Lord. Did you hear that? To cover myself. Oh, how the flesh hates to be exposed. Even to this I'm called to die. That which I would call my dignity. But if this is what it takes for his children to hear, then let those who have ears to hear, hear what the Spirit is saying to you today. I woke up deeply ashamed and disgusted knowing that the Lord was telling me that in the same way I was abusing this body that was not mine in the dream, in the same way this is what we do to his body that is not ours. 
in a way he was showing me in a very graphic way what it is like when we give into the flesh. It seems an unspeakable thing to say, but it's no different than Paul saying to the Corinthians that they cannot be one with a harlot and God. The flesh nature is a harlot through and through and always lusts. However, our body belongs to him. This was a very graphic way to show me the sin of spiritual fornication. Ever in my life would I have seen it in this light unless he showed me this. And he allowed me to see this and my guilt in it for you to see the gravity of our little pet sins that is an obstruction to the working of the Spirit of God through us. We are abusing his body. In Hebrews 12 we read of Esau, verse 16 and 17, Lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. For ye know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. Have you ever wondered why Esau was called a fornicator? It's because he lusted after food. Food seems to be the enemy's speciality, starting in the garden, and it's linked to fornication, because it's an issue of lust. We look at those who are guilty of lusting whilst watching porn or using women, whilst we stand in front of our fridge lusting after food and say that the one is worse than the other. Lust is lust. It's the same spirit that works to take control of us. We can lust for food, sex, power, money, approval, success, material things, and even spiritual things that we covered from others. Some lusts can be seen on the body, some are hidden, but none are hidden from his eyes. And those who have been caught in the snare of sexual lust will tell you that there comes a point where you simply cannot say no anymore. You've become a slave. In fact, Romans 1 tells us that they will be given over to a reprobate mind. The very mind that is supposed to serve the law of God. This revelation has caused me to understand the gravity of it because God does not play around with sin as we do. He calls it a lion that waits at the door. What we see as cute kittens are actually lions. Esau gave up his birthright for food. What a scary thought. It was not that Esau was not saved anymore, but what he lost was huge. The birthright is his inheritance. And my birthright, my inheritance is exactly what Father was talking to me about, warning me that I can lose it. He has been speaking to me about things to come for me that he has planned, but he wanted me to realize that unless I deal with this issue, I stand to lose it. Do we really want to lose our inheritance over something that we lust after? Of course, we wouldn't want to call it lust. 1 Corinthians three sixteen to 17 says, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy, which ye are. Have you ever truly thought of your body as holy? How do you dress? What do you eat? What do you watch? Are you defiling the temple of the Spirit? Paul says that whether we eat or whether we drink, do all for the glory of God. This is not only about food, it's about lust. Sexual sin corrupts the body and this is why it is so serious when married because the husband and wife is one body. In the same way, we are Christ's bride and one with him. Paul says in 1 Corinthians six seventeen, But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. It's important for us to understand that the context of 1 Corinthians 6 is that of Paul admonishing the Corinthian church to flee from fornication. This fornication is both physical and spiritual because these two are one. And that they are to understand that they cannot be one with the Lord and this world. They cannot be one with the harlot and God. 
we know that the church as we know it presently is very much a harlot. Let's read 1 Corinthians 6 verse 12 and 13. All things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Meats for the belly and the belly for meats, but God shall destroy both it and them. Now the body is not for fornication, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. Verse 18 and 19, flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? Let me ask you, how much do you think the Lord longs to bless you spiritually with that which he has promised you, walking in the fullness of your call, but because you have not submitted to him in certain areas, he cannot give it to you. You are getting frustrated with him and think that maybe you are just not good enough or it's simply not meant to be. There is no partiality in God. He is waiting on you to submit. We want to be used by the Lord and we want the gifts of the Spirit. But one of the very first things we must do is to present our bodies as a living sacrifice. What does that actually mean? Well, Paul addresses this in the very chapter that discusses the different role and functions of the body of Christ. Referring to the body of Christ that have different members and therefore different functions. But he has a prerequisite to this, and that is that our actual physical bodies must first be given to the Lord. So please do not lose sight that we are still busy with abiding, which is also to obey. Okay, we can only obey when we submit. Romans 12, verse 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. The moment you hear living sacrifice, you should think priesthood. Yeshua is our great high priest and what he requires is a whole burnt offering. Not only must you be completely sanctified on the altar of God, but also burnt. The smell of this whole burnt offering is pleasing unto him. And this burnt ashes is known also as the fat of the offering. It's the choice part, the best you give him. It is total and ultimate. And this is what the Holy Spirit is doing in you. First, with the sword of the Spirit, the high priest cuts and divides between soul and spirit, and then you are consumed with the fire of the Spirit. He's not only making you holy, but also holy, sacrificing you. However, Paul is beseeching, urging them to present their bodies to the Lord as a living sacrifice, as holy, and it must be acceptable unto him. Our bodies are not even acceptable to ourselves at the moment. The point is that the one who does this is you. He's not going to force you on this altar. We must choose. Being a living sacrifice means that you also are not doing this once off, but that the sacrifice is living, which means continuous. You always bear your cross. You always crucify that flesh nature. And this is the very first step we are to take. We are to present our bodies. Now the second step is that we are to not be conformed to this world. The second cannot happen unless you have first given your body. There will always be this pull to the world unless you have given him your body in totality. Because this world is all about lust in its different forms. To not be conformed to this world is to not think like this world. In other words, here the issue is the mind of thoughts. This will determine how we walk in the spirit because we want to live by what comes from the mouth of God, not the mouth of the world. 
For this, you have to be truthful and examine yourself and ask, in what area do I still think like the world? Where do I compromise in my stance? Do I still want the world's approval? Do I think I need to look, talk and live like them? Because to be conformed to this world means to fashion yourself to or to think or walk in the same pattern. And then thirdly, Paul says that they are to rather be transformed by the renewing of their minds. Let's face it. Scripture says that as a man thinketh, so he is. If you cannot define your toxic thinking, whether from yourself or the enemy, what then are you transforming? You need to be able to define it, bring it to the Lord and ask the Spirit to divide between soul and spirit to cut away and consume it with the fire on the altar. This means you actually have to make time for it and ask Him to show you. You work with the Spirit. You cannot be general about it. No, focus on it. Call it what it is and repent when necessary and pursue this transformation. With each renewing of your mind, there is a transformation coming until you reach the maturity that he desires. And of course, the method of cutting with the sword is of God, right? By his divine wisdom and ways, not yours. To be transformed is the word metamorpho, right? Metamorphosis, which means to change into a complete another form. We know That we are being transformed into the likeness of Christ. So, first you present your body. Then you define in what way you still think like the world. And walk like the world. And then you renew your mind. But you cannot stop here. Now you have to do differently. What you previously did, you can no longer do. This is the life of a Christian. And at times it's easy. But mostly it's not. This also happens by degrees depending on your maturity in the Lord. To those who have much, much is required. He will ask of me things that he would not ask others because the call upon my life requires it. And as you grow and mature in the spirit, the requirements to give up certain things become more or greater. Nothing is off limits. Nothing. First, obvious things are asked of us when we get saved, like addictions, foul language, wrong friends and places. But as the Holy Spirit starts to convict you and goes deeper into the marrow of the bone, the very life in you, he starts addressing things like attitudes and prejudices and healing, right? These are the more unseen things, the intents and motives of the heart. And then lastly, the Spirit brings you to the place where that which is not sinful but permissible is to be given up. Paul says that all things are permissible, but not all profitable. This means that even though what you are doing at that time, even though it's not sin, it is not necessarily profitable for where he is going with you and does not serve his purpose. For instance, I I watched something, it was quite cute. And while I'm watching it, he told me, that is beneath you. Just like that. Stop it. So he raises us up to this place through many trials as those very trials have built in you the fortitude and resilience to be absolute towards him in all things. Others may not understand this, but this is only because they've not yet been trained in it. The greater our responsibility in the Lord, the more he will require of us. However, This is a place of abiding, utter dependence, where only the Spirit gives us the grace to be willing and able to do the will of God. The more mature you become in the Lord, the more weaker and childlike you become because of how the flesh has been dealt with. There's a greater dependency that has been built in you through the Spirit's dealings through all the years. God does not deal with us all the same way. But his principle stays the same. He always works from the principle of life out of death. The greater the death, the greater the life of Christ working in you because of the abiding in him. It all hangs on the will whom you submit yourself to. 
Now, lastly, Paul mentions that the reason why they are to present their bodies as a living sacrifice, not to be conformed to this world and to renew their minds, is for the purpose that they will be able to prove, that is, discern what is the good, acceptable and perfect will of God. If you want to know the will of Father in a certain area, here is your formula in Romans 12, verse 1 and 2. This word prove means to test, examine, scrutinize and to deem worthy. You simply cannot discern what is good, acceptable or perfect will is unless you first go through the right steps. Okay, now why do we need to go through such a long process? Because God seeks alignment. He seeks alignment between your body, soul and spirit through which his spirit must flow through you. Think of a water pipe that has a kink or a leak in it. The water cannot flow through it as it ought and not with the right force either. In the same way he is saying how can two walk together unless they agree? God wants to bring you in perfect alignment but you must first submit in every situation your will to him a christian is the strongest in his weakest moment only then can the strength of god god abide over him a christian is at his weakest in pride for pride goes before a fall when your emotions of anger resentment offense or self-pity rises up in your gut you have an immediate choice to make. It's not what will I say, but rather to whom will I submit to. Having said all this, living from the Spirit or to abide in Him cannot be separated from living from every word that He speaks. So this morning as I was meditating on this subject, the thought came to me that God speaks a lot less than what we think and He speaks a lot more as well. What I mean by that is that a lot of our talking, saying that he said something, is actually us speaking. How much is really from him? And on the flip side, he does say so much through so many ways, but unfortunately we are unable to pick up on them. Our senses are not exercised. In Hebrews 5.14 it says, but strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Yeshua told the disciples that he has meat that they do not know of. He said that this meat is to do the will of the Father. So strong meat and being of full age has to do with discipline. Disciplining the body, disciplining our mind, and therefore being able to discern the will of God. As you can see, our senses have to be exercised, and this is done through reason of use. That means the ability to pick up when he speaks to you so that you may know his will. This then is showing us that we grow in our senses, our spiritual senses. Um, This word senses means your ability to judge or discern. We grow in discernment. Discernment is more than a matter of truth versus lie. Discernment is about knowing the one who is the truth. We get to know our God through various means, but his desire is that we will learn to become one in spirit with him by having the mind of Christ. We are told to be still and know that he is God. Being still is more than just your ability to shut your mouth. Being still is also a disposition. The image I have is that of still waters. You know, our body is made up of 70% water. And what he desires of us is that the waters within us would be still so that there's no ripple on the waters. Perfect quiet and rest within in spite of what happens on the outside and when he speaks only his voice the sound of his voice forms a ripple on our inner waters but our lives are so extremely busy and the reality is that our insides our waters are like waves at times 
many voices. They reflect our mind that is like a busy highway, a little cars on their missions going to their designated posts. This is in stark contrast to scripture that tells us that he has not given us a spirit of fear, but of love, power and a sound mind. Most of us simply do not have a sound mind. This word sound means to have a disciplined mind. Can you see how this relates to do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind? In other words, renewing your mind also has to do with having a disciplined mind. A mind that can stay fixed on God. A mind that can become quiet in His presence. A mind that can be still. This does not come overnight. It's a discipline. It will cost you. The question is, are you willing? Are you willing to get up earlier? Are you willing to fast for it? Are you willing to switch the TV off? Are you willing to let go of that which is earthly and temporary for that which is spiritual and eternal? You cannot expect to grow in hearing his voice if you are not willing to do your part. Our spiritual senses are our spiritual eyes and ears that have to be trained to be able to pick up on the many ways he speaks to us. But if your mind is so busy with so many things at the same time, you will only pick up on them here and there and miss out on a whole lot. Proverbs 23, 26 says, My son, give me your heart and let your eyes observe my ways. This means that your heart and your ability to perceive his ways, his will, are connected. He wants your whole heart, meaning your soul, which includes the faculties of your mind. In Psalm 32, he says that he will guide us with his eye. This means that he will show us things. How will you pick up on them unless you have trained your senses? They have to be under the control of the Spirit. And this will not happen because you ask Him. No, you have to exercise your senses. You have to become still and learn to wait on Him. Learn to wait in silence. Learn to wait in worship. And learn to wait on Him as He opens the Word to you. All other voices have to be silenced so that he can have preeminence. You have to train yourself, discipline yourself, and stretch your ability to wait through endurance. And you receive what he says by faith in those moments and wait on him to break the bread, reveal his heart concerning what he's told you. Write it down and guard it in your heart. Remember, the fowls of the air want to steal that which, he has not, uh, that which has not taken root in you. Remember, the cares and the worries of this world will want to strangle the life out of that seed. And you are responsible for the seed that he sows in your heart. As you do, you grow and your senses become more acute and you start to pick up more readily what the Spirit is showing you right through the day. Be vigilant. Be diligent. This is how you learn to know him who is the truth. Because you know his voice. You know him by virtue of your senses having been exercised. To abide is to obey. But how can you know his will when you've not learned to recognize his voice? You have to learn to become still. Isaiah 26, 3, it says, Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. We are to live by every word that comes from the mouth of God. We are to live from that heavenly bread. This bread will sustain, keep, comfort, and guide us in the time to come, and so we will abide in him. If you've noticed that you are like a hamster on a wheel and the wheel just never stops, then you had better get off the wheel and wait on him. You come to a point in all your ministering or work, whatever it may be, whether you know, you're at home or at a business or ministry, where you are eventually giving from out of yourself and not of him. Not only will you run eventually on empty, but 
you are working from soul power and your body won't make it. And because it sounds religious, good, or have an effect on people, you convince yourself that it's the spirit working through you. But we must remember the words of George Douglas Watson. He said, it's very easy for even sanctified souls to become attached to their work and do want it to succeed as their work. Jesus does not want us to be wedded to his work instead of him. In John 17, Yeshua prayed that his disciples would be one and that they would be one with him and the Father. Oneness cannot be separated from wholeness. If there is any part still not fully aligned in you, then that oneness is still incomplete. We are all a work in progress. The Holy Spirit is so gentle in preparing us as a beautiful bride for our bridegroom. But we have to understand that as gentle as he is, he is God. And when you give your life to him, that is exactly what you are giving. You give your life to him and he will take it. He wants all of it. He wants a whole burnt offering. It's uh, something that Tozer said. He said, if the spirit takes charge of your life, he will expect unquestioning obedience in everything. He will not tolerate in you the self-sins, even though they are permitted and excused by most Christians. So I end of this devotional teaching with a word from the Lord that I received on the 26th of December 2021, and it's called a whole burnt offering. My child, it's not what you do, but with what heart you do. You can do the greatest things for me, and yet your heart can be divided or far from me. I want your heart in the big and the small. But you think I do not care as much about the small as the big. You would be wrong. For out of the heart flows the issues of life. Therefore, it is your heart that I look at. Your heart determines the value of the deed. I want your whole heart. And this means absolute obedience. Because when you obey me in all things, it requires absolute dependence for you can do nothing without me. Nothing. For this you have to give me your body as a living sacrifice so that I can live through you. Your obedience can only be achieved in the measure of your dependence on me. For that you have to give me your whole body. I said that if you obey me, you will be abide in me. In my love, just as I obeyed my father and remained in his love. Love is the fulfillment of the law. Your obedience to me is a declaration of your love. And when you abide in my love, you can ask me anything and I will give it to you. But your obedience must be in all things. Do you understand just how much you have to depend on me, especially considering that the flesh is in enmity with my spirit? No longer are you indebted to walk after the flesh, but to be controlled by my spirit. These are my sons and daughters, not because they say so, but because they've allowed my spirit to live through them, their body. Now you're not that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, know that what I need of you is complete surrender in utmost dependence upon me. I want your whole heart. Your heart, which is your mind by which you make decisions, determines the course of your life. When you are deliberately disobedient towards me, do you not see how your heart is divided? 1 Thessalonians 5 says, And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body. Is your obedience to me complete? Have I not said that it is not sacrifice that I require, but obedience? The pagans do sacrifice, but I am the God who searches the hearts of men to see whether their hearts are true. And this is why you have to search your heart and ask me to show you where you are still disobedient in what I've asked of you. Take stock, because it's by desire to sanctify every part of you, spirit, soul and body, holy, 
which is to be set apart unto me so that my life can be the life by which you live by. If you are not sanctified holy, there will be those parts, whether in the spirit, soul or body, that are still subject to another master, whether the flesh or the enemy. Nobody can have two masters, for he will hate the one and love the other. He will despise the one and cling to the other. Your eye has to be single in your devotion to me, because when it's not, you are still walking in darkness. I want to show you so much, but this can only be done when you have a single eye. There's more I want to show my children, but they are still divided in their heart. Therefore be zealous to obey me, because it's not in your declaration that you are devoted to me, but in your actions. You can say that you love me with all your heart, but your obedience to what I've told you still reflects the true state of your heart. Yes, you can do nothing without me. And this is why you will often falter as you learn to depend on me. Once again, I take all things into account, but to those who have much, much is required. Those who have reached a certain maturity in me, I will require more as stewards of my flock. And those who are still young and growing, I will guide as the good shepherd that I am. I discipline those I love. Because just like your earthly fathers, I know when your heart was deliberate in disobedience or whether you tried and are still learning. Am I not a father that pities his children? Do I not know your frame and that you are dust? I'm slow to anger and rich in mercy and I do not always chide or keep my anger forever. I do not deal with you after your sins nor reward you according to your iniquity. But I pity those who fear me and those who keep my covenant, those who remember my commandments to do them. I see all things and I know the desires of your heart. Am I not a loving father who know how to give a good gifts to those whom I love? I surely am. Therefore, be earnest to seek my will in all you do. Do not lean on your own understanding. But acknowledge me in all your ways. This was the will of my son, to do my will. And so his desire is to do my will still. And I'm well pleased with my son. Let him express his obedience and love to me by doing my will through your body. Give me your body. And see if I will not indeed reward you as a father would an obedient son and daughter. I love you, my child. I love you with an everlasting love, for you are mine. Look unto me in this time where all the enemy wants to do is to take your eyes off me. You can only follow me when you look to me. Trust me. Lean on me for everything. I will never fail you. Amen.